Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 32 of Kerbal Space Ships Are Serious Business, and we are back out at Venus. The little Venus device has been orbiting the planet for well, hundreds and hundreds of days now. It's seen all sorts of terrain, but I think now, now is the time that we are going to start aerobraking this thing into a lower orbit, and it will take a very, very long time because the engine on this thing, or sorry, this spacecraft does not have any heat shield or anything. So we kind of need to just graze through the upper five kilometers or so of the atmosphere. If we fall too low, we will almost certainly destroy our spacecraft. But of course, on our first entrance, we start getting that sweet, sweet, sweet flying science. Getting up close and personal with Venus and revealing all sorts of new information. Transmitting that back home. And then, well, then things turn out to be really long and boring. Because in the stock Kerbal Space Program, you pretty much have to warp your way around, time accelerate through the atmosphere, then uh, just repeat that. Every time you do this, you drop down little by little. But if you drop the periaps too much, then you start having to worry about overheating. Such as this case here, where my lower fuel tank starts to overheat. So... Periodically, I have to then boost my spacecraft's periaps back up. Using a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of my delta V. I only have like about 100 meters per second left, but that's going to be enough. Anyway, speaking of delta V, we have a mission that is going to need a ton of it. The mission codenamed Egotistical Goat. Yes, this cryptically named mission is going to refer to one giant leap for this space program. Yes, seven years after beginning this space program, I believe that it is time for us to commit ourselves to sending a person to the moon and returning them safely to the Earth. No mission has required as great an effort as this one. I literally did a live stream where I kind of designed half of the rocket. Uh, I decided that I wasn't going to show you the rocket design, but I did start uh, streaming bits and pieces of it, although I was being kind of uh, assaulted by my kids at the same time. So with the egotistical goat primed on the pad, fully, f fully fueled, fully fueled, fueled by fuels, full of fools. I don't. It's dangerous. No, our our pilot for today will be Gail Porter. Uh, we are going to put a woman on the moon first because we've managed to kill off all the men, and I can't hire any new ones. Uh, also, she is the most qualified individual for the job. Look at the amount of Delta V we have. We actually have more than we need. There is a final stage which gives me about two kilometers per second of get out of jail free Delta V. As in, should I be stuck in the orbit of the moon, I should be able to return home with it. Throttling the engines up, waiting for them to come to power. Look at the thrust. Three, four, five, hundred, three hundred, lot, stage, and on. Oh, Almost, it fell back a few inches there, but now it is moving upwards here. Look at the number of engines in this thing. Look at the size of it. I believe that is actually taller than the vehicle assembly building. God knows how I managed to build that thing because I clearly haven't upgraded it to a high enough level. <laughs> but yeah, off we go and we're back to four times time acceleration here because this is a long and slow process. First thing to note, I disabled stability control on this because flying with any kind of stability control for the first two stages really caused wet noodle rocket syndrome. Uh, the thing would just flip around, wobble around, and yeah, trying. I also thought while trying to fly this thing, I was trying to turn things around to get you the right angle there. Uh, you can see there are a lot of boosters there. You can also see every time I perform a steering operation that the thrust plate that is attached to the bottom of that thing is wobbling around. It's sliding around on the bottom of the rocket. Of course, these kind of oscillations can be very dangerous to real rockets. As those engines move around, the fuel lines get flexed and sometimes they get kinked and that means that the flow rates change and that can actually set up self sustaining oscillations called pogo oscillations. This did actually happen on Apollo 13. It wasn't the cause of Apollo 13's problems, but 
Uh, yeah, in the second stage, they had five J2 hydrogen engines, and uh, the center one, as it oscillated up and down, the change in the volume of the fuel lines meant it would alternately increase and decrease thrust. Thankfully, it got shut down before it could destroy the rest of the rocket, or uh, Apollo 13, 13 might have been a much shorter movie. Anyway, we have no J2 engines on this. We did not develop that technology. We are using the LR87H2 engines. Also, we did not use the magnificent F1 engines that the Apollo spacecraft used because we did not, well, we did, did have that technology, but the efficiency of them, I decided, was less than awesome. Therefore, I thought I would go with the multiple huge numbers of hydrogen engines on them to get uh, really good efficiency on that first stage. As it happens with those external boosters, the rocket was only uh, about 20% lighter than the Saturn. But, uh, well, it has some features the Saturn was, doesn't. And the Saturn has a number of features I didn't. Three and a half minutes into the launch and we are on to the second set, or the second stage of the rocket again. More of these magnificent high thrust engines that sadly never flew. We don't have the J2, uh, so we're making do with these. There we go, eight of them on this stage. Generating over 600 tons of thrust. And many comments about how tons are actually a unit of mass and therefore shouldn't be used to represent thrust. Just, look, you know what I mean, right? I mean, while you guys are arguing over mass versus, you know, force versus weight, I am arguing with my solar panels and trying to figure out why the solar panels are not clickable. I wanted to deploy the solar panels, but no, I wasn't unable to do it, so I clicked around for a while and eventually gave up. I decided that I would reload while in orbit, and if the spacecraft was then stuck, uh, yeah, I would just have to give up. You can get a better view of this whole spacecraft from here. What I am doing is disabling a lot of my RCS thruster fuel to make sure that I don't draw fuel from stages too high up. We're going to obviously need that RCS thrusters uh, for uh, basically helping engines ignite at the appropriate time. So we're disabling cross feed, we've got these little tanks around the outside, closing them all down, shutting them down, making sure that we will preserve their fuel for future generations of stages. I mean, given that this is realism overhaul, I didn't want to have tons of fuel being cross-fed inwards asparagus style. I wanted more conventional rocket stages. And having huge clusters of engines, that really was the Soviet approach in their moon rocket. Obviously, the, having lots of engines close to each other means that if one explodes, it takes out the ones next to them. So uh, there's a certain advantage to having five F1s as opposed to something like 28 uh, NK-33s. Anyway, we are approaching stage cutout here, and this next stage will be a little more sedate in its separation because we have to make sure the fuel has settled correctly. There we go. Moving apart ever so slowly, firing those little uh, reaction control thrusters, and then kicking in with the RL-10 thrusters. We have five of these on this stage, again, because we didn't have the J-2. So anyway, I guess my only real concession to kerbalness on this rocket was in the first stage, I had the solid rocket boosters, which, you know, kind of made sense. But did you know that they actually were considering something called uh, an Aerojet 280, I believe is what it was? Uh, it was going to be a giant solid rocket booster instead of the first stage of the Saturn V. And this, they, they built this and it was like 280 inches across, 260 inches, I don't know, but it was... Uh, the largest solid rocket booster ever fired, and they basically put it in a pit upside down and fired the engi engine upside down, and uh, you know it generated something like 1,700 tons of thrust, and even more comments. Anyway, this third stage continues burning across the the South Atlantic over Africa. The moon has risen, the sun has risen, but unfortunately we can't get those solar panels online just yet. We're going to have to wait for a maintenance check, uh, which will probably be F5 followed by F9, I suspect. Perhaps even a reload. There has been a lot of reloading with this, and this is kind of the reasons why I think I'm bringing this series to some sort of conclusion, mostly because I've had a really hard time getting, um, 
your realistic progression, working and loading my save files. So, you know, up Kerbal Space Program is upgraded. In the meantime, we had a lot of different websites, that, you know, web hosts disappeared, things moved, people stopped with their mods. So getting a compatible set of mods that works with a saved game has just been horrible and painful and I'd prefer to just be washed, wash my hands of the whole thing. <laughs> Move on to something else. But not before I've put someone on the moon in the Kerbal equivalent of 1952. This is obviously an alternative universe where, uh, after World War II, the US was worried that there were still Nazis on the moon and decided to uh, focus their efforts on getting up there so they can actually fight the remains of uh, the Nazi forces led by Mecha Hitler. And of course those references to Nazis in the moon are going to have many people commenting about Iron Sky, but I will point out that Iron Sky does not have Hitler, never mind Mecha Hitler on the moon. Iron Sky 2 does actually have Hitler in it, riding a dinosaur inside the hollow earth. But the earth is not hollow here, we are in orbit, we have successfully placed the payload and now we're going to extend these panels. Yay! Finally, we can start pushing some power into our batteries and stop them feeling so depleted and unloved. So we have about six solar panels, and unfortunately, I discovered later that I had put on the wrong solar panels. Anyway, uh, maneuver to the translunar injection trajectory takes a little bit of work, but uh, nothing particularly special, and we're certainly not rushing in the same way as we used to now that we have the magic of cryogenic tanks. In fact, the position for the burn is more or less uh, halfway around the world, so we have to go and almost do a complete orbit before we can light off the engines. That gives us plenty of time to make sure the spacecraft is shipshape and all set up. Our parking orbit is 1.38 degrees misaligned from the lunar orbit, which is uh, acceptable in the end, but we're set up and engines ready to fire. So of course we start firing the reaction control thrusters and the RL-10s light up, emitting beautiful blue ionized hydrogen gas into the night sky. It looks like we've got about 400 meters per second of excess delta V, which is good because we don't want to have to use the next stage for uh, any orbital insertion or any translunar injection because uh, we're going to have to do a translation, rotation and docking maneuver first and we don't want to have to do that in the middle of a maneuver burn to take us to the moon. Yes, one of my early prototypes suffered from that particular problem. So these simulations, by the way, using the Kerbal construction time, the simulations are costing something like 50,000 funds every time I try to launch a simulated vehicle. So. It is. Uh, it has been quite expensive just developing the technology to launch this thing. I think the vehicle cost is only about two hundred and seventy thousand. So, um, in the end, it's pretty good when you consider that uh, the payout for this is going to be over three million. There is the moon rising, and my spacecraft accelerating over the horizon. At least now the spacecraft is light enough that I can use the smart ASS to hold attitude. Previously, of course, it was, there was too much wobbling, especially with that thrust plate doing the shimmy around the bottom of things, around the bottom of the rocket. Uh, anyway, yeah, we're going to continue, we'll bring this up, and ideally, we're going to make sure the main booster ends up on a course which intersects the moon so that we don't have to worry about it flying around and eventually being misidentified as a, an asteroid in the future. That did actually happen with uh, the third stage of Apollo 12. If you check my recent Universe Sandbox 2 video, then you'll see that uh, you'll see some discussion of that and demonstration of its orbit. So yeah, I at this point I'm trying to make some slight tweaks to the orbit, and I start doing it using the reaction control thrusters, but then realize I might as well try using these engines just to give it a bit of a kick. Uh, the problem with using the big engines is they take a moment to warm up and then they suddenly really kick in and then things change too quickly. So what I do is I shut down all these engines and leave just the one engine to fire, which means that things should change a little more, uh, a little more slowly and I should be able to perhaps get that all-important lunar impact trajectory set out. So here we go. Get the camera lined up for optimum navigation. Go over my checklists. Uh, where are my checklists? Uh, the only thing I have on this checklist is make sure rockets work. 
So uh, I'm going to have to make sure I have my reaction control system turned on and translating forward and then fire the engine when I think the fuel has settled. And then be ready to shut it. Great, vapor and feed lines shut down. Clearly, I didn't have that ready. Good news is, while I have seven ignitions available on this, I guess if I'm really stressed or really stuck, I can use the other ones. Okay, here we go. Try again. Engines, go! And then watch it. It was really fast and I turn it off too soon. Darn it! The moon is only about 2,000 kilometers across, so uh, <laughs> there's only a tiny fraction of a second to get this right. Fuel, very stable. Once again, fire them engines. And go and stop too soon. I stopped too soon and the vapor in the feed lines again. Damn it, you vapor. What? Wait, what? The, okay, but at least we got it. We got it. This space course is now on a collision course with another planet. We have but a few days to make sure we change that. Actually, the problem will be making sure that we don't change it too much just by turning the spacecraft. So now it's uh, important, well now it's time for that all important transposition uh, and transition and docking. I can't remember what they called it, but basically what we're going to do is translate the spacecraft forward, turn around, and then come back and dock. Now we're using the fuel docking thing here because uh, it's lighter. That's really what's going on, nothing else. So let the spacecraft move forwards very, very slowly. We can afford to take our time here. Everyone is being asked to hold attitude along the prograde vector. That might, does mean there might be some uh, rotation issues here, but I think we'll be fine. And so we begin the uh, rotation and the docking. Now, of course, if this fails at this point, we have enough delta V in this stage to get us home. If something went wrong, that meant that we couldn't pull that lander out of there. We would still have a spacecraft that could get us safely home. That's the idea. Nice view from inside the capsule. Of course, this capsule is not designed for docking, so we can't actually look forwards. We don't have any sights or anything. We do have this strange third-person camera, which has no real physical explanation in this universe, but I'm going to exploit it to make sure that I actually put the spacecraft on target. Egotistical Goat Lander is going to fuse once again into Egotistical Goat Voltron. And with their combined superpowers, the moon will no longer be a challenge to them. But uh, beforehand, I'm just going to make sure I grab whatever fuel I can from this stage. Yeah, we've actually been burning fuel from the reaction control thrusters in that other stage. Far from ideal, but uh, I guess we're going to have to accept that. Okay, decouple, and off we go. Nice. So we are now free to navigate. And our first order of business will be to make sure that we are not on a collision course with the moon. Because that would be... that would void our warranty. I mean, I'm pretty sure if you read the warranty on the Apollo service module, it would probably say something like warranty void if you crash it into the moon. I mean, that's not something that most warranties have to worry about. I mean, my vacuum cleaner warranty doesn't mention crashing into the moon because... What are the odds of a vacuum cleaner going to the moon, except perhaps as part of a urine collection system? Actually, who am I kidding? I mean, when you're in space, you use the vacuum of space to suck, you know, urine out of your... Yeah, but I have... does occur to me that Gale, being female, may have a different um, collection system. I had not really considered that prior to this mission, but we have tested life support in space. Anyway, uh, we have the we have the maneuver node set up. We just need to perform this small maneuver here. It's only a few feet per a few meters per second, not more than about ten feet per second, but that will be enough for us to miss the moon and fly around it and put ourselves on a nice trajectory for landing. So uh, just get ourselves lined up, and we messed up once again. Vapor in the feed lines. Okay. Translate once again, and now we get it, and cut off at the right time, and overshot once again. <sighs> that is a fundamental problem with these rockets, is we tend to just overshoot a lot. Although overshooting in this case just means that our uh, altitude of rendezvous is going to be higher than we expected. So now it's just going to be several days as we travel to the moon. We can uh, shut down some of the navigation systems to make sure that we are stable. There is the egotistical goat probe. It will follow us on the way to the moon, but eventually it will fall out of sight and onto its own destiny. 
And I don't think I have the impact science stuff engaged, uh, enabled in this, so I won't be able to collect seismic wave studies from this thing hitting the moon, which would be cool to have, but uh, yeah, completely forgot to install that mod, and this thing is getting incredibly unstable. Literally, the game has micro pauses all the time as garbage collection happens. So, you know, if you've ever seen Kerbal Space Program do that pattern where it moves, pauses, moves, pauses, it's almost certainly doing garbage collection, where it's essentially freeing up memory in an automated process. Anyway, I'm not going to let something like garbage collection stop me getting to the moon, but we'll see that in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.